Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for the moments in our lives when you gaze into our eyes and down to the depths of our soul and you call us to be different. You call us to follow you. You call us to trust. You call us, Lord God, to a life of service. All of us have that call upon our lives through our baptism. We pray that today that that call may be strengthened and encouraged and made more hopeful because we have been together singing your praises, praying, and lifting up our voices as one people with one Lord and one mission in this mission field that you've called us to. May the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing to you, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. The grace and peace of Jesus Christ be with your spirits. I bring you greetings from the 455 churches throughout the North Texas and Central Texas Conference who are helping people to love God, who are proclaiming new life in Jesus Christ, who are serving others, especially the poor, and doing justice. I know it's already been a long day for all of you here today, especially the preachers. And, uh, and the laity, too. You could be doing something else this afternoon, taking care of some last-minute things before your week got started. But let me tell you that I am deeply honored and humbled by your presence. And so again, thank you. I know that our non-denominational brethren are very concerned because the Methodists are having church on Sunday at 4 o'clock. <laughs> I'd like to take this time to introduce and acknowledge my new friend, the Right Reverend George Sumner, Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Dallas, who is here to represent our, our ecumenical relationship. So thank you, Bishop, for being here today. The Reverend Dr. Eric Gronsberg, Bishop of the North, Northern Texas and Northern Louisiana Synod, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, could not be with us today. He had a commitment that conflicted with this, but his presence also here is acknowledged, his desire to be here. Thank you to the North and Central Texas Conference Committees on Episcopacy for making this afternoon celebration of assignment worship service possible. Thank you so much. Would you please stand so we can acknowledge you? Thank you. Thank you to the worship coordinators, the choir directors, and especially the combined choirs of First Fort Worth and University Park United Methodist Church for being here and, and gracing us with your presence and your music. For the choirs and the musicians for leading us in worship, thank you for offering your gifts for us this afternoon. Thank you, Reverend Joe Stobaugh and all the University Park staff and church members for graciously and warmly hosting us this afternoon. I'd like to recognize our two conference lay leaders, Mrs. Darlene Alfred and Mrs. Kim Brannon. Would you please stand? These two faithful servants represent the voices and ministry of the laity within our conferences with much care and excellence. I'm indebted to my two assistants to the Episcopal Office, Dr. Clifton Howard from the Central Texas Conference and Reverend Andy Lewis from the North Texas Conference. Would you two please stand? <laughs> Their orientation and wise counsel and support have been invaluable during my short time here and I'm grateful for them. I'd like to recognize and thank today the seven district superintendents who extend the office of the bishop and oversee the total ministry of clergy and laity and of the churches in their communities of the district in their missions and witness and service in the world. Would you all please stand? Reverend Philip Rhodes, <laughs> Beverly Connolly, Danny Tenney from the Central Texas Conference, please remain standing. Reverends Todd Harris, Cassie Wade, Edlin Cowley, and uh, Reverend Deborah Hobbs Mason, who could not be with us today. These district superintendents, I am grateful for their spiritual discernment, for their strategic le leadership, their commitment to the church's mission, and the working relationship they have with clergy, laity, and congregations on my behalf. Thank you so much for your ministry. <laughs> Dr. Will Cotton, Reverends Laura Franklin, Cami Gaston, and Dr. Owen Ross, strengthen us. Would you please stand? They strengthen and support the conference's nurture, outreach, and witness ministries 
and equip clergy and laity for ministry and mission in the world. Thank you for your, for your work. <laughs> Dr. Ron Henderson serves as the North Texas Conference Officer for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, focusing on racial justice within our conference and in the world. Dr. Henderson, where are you? There you are, right there. Thank you, Dr. Vance, Morden, and Pamela Hughes and their support staff do an outstanding job executing strategic communications, promoting our image and reputation to a watching world, and managing crisis communication. Would you please stand? Uh, they're, they're everywhere, and I'll support that. Yes. Thank you. And Betty Alexander and Joel uh, Stanislaus serve as my two administrative assistants. They ensure that all processes are followed, all phone calls are followed up on, correspondence is attended to, and that I keep my calendar of events and meetings in order. Thank you so much. Where's Betty and Joel? And where are they? There she is, right there. Thank you, Joel. And it, I thank God for the grace and mercy that God has demonstrated to me throughout the years of, of life. To God be all the honor and all the glory and all the praise. With me this afternoon is Maya, as she has already been introduced. And by the way, that was a total surprise. <laughs> uh, my spouse and best friend for 45 years, and three of the four children, Christina, Reuben III, and Isaac, and my three grandchildren, Amaya, Malachi, Zechariah, and we're going to have Zephaniah, Amos, uh, Haggai and all, all the prophets. We're going to have all the pro oh, the, uh, the major and the minor prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah. <laughs> you can tell where I'm going with this, right? Well, let me tell you what. A service of celebration for the assignment of a bishop is somewhat like a Halley's Comet. Halley's Comet is visible to the naked eye from Earth every 75 to 79 years. <laughs> the comet last appeared in 1986. And it'll appear again in mid-2061. Some get to see the comet twice in their life. I, I vaguely remember hearing about Halley's Comet in 1986, but I didn't see it. If I'm 100 years old, I might get to see it in 2061. The Lord willing. So say the date now. The next celebration of an assignment of a new bishop to this area, the Lord willing, will be nine years from now. Sometime in the fall of 2032. Some in the room from the Central Texas Conference have seen this rare event twice in one year. So God have mercy on them. <laughs> I want to share some thoughts with you this afternoon about what it means to me to hold the office as your Episcopal leader, its duties and responsibilities as a privilege and honor and a sacred trust. As I read today's scripture and prepared this message through the lens of a bishop, Assigned to lead and oversee the spiritual and temporal affairs of the United Methodist Church within the boundaries of our two conferences, and particularly to lead the church in its mission and witness and service in the world, I was struck by Jesus' emphasis on the possessive determiner, my. My English teacher would be very proud of me because I remember that. <laughs> Feed my lambs. Care for my sheep. Feed my sheep. Mine, said Jesus. A single possessive determiner like Maya's in my car, my ball, my house, my friend, makes a claim of ownership by declaring who owns something or someone. When Jesus says to Peter, feed my lambs, care for and feed my sheep, he means that he and he alone is the owner and possessor of all the new and more mature believers in him. And by deduction, Peter, the first bishop of the church, is not. He is not the owner of the lambs and the sheep. Christ is the owner. However, Peter is accountable to Christ for his care and nurture of Christ's flock. When Jesus responds to Peter's three affirmations of love with care for my lambs, feed my sheep, and care for my sheep, he is telling Peter and the new believers, the lambs, the children, you know, lambs and sheep are from the same family system, right? It's like having a calf and a cow. A lamb is a young sheep. So when Jesus says, feed my lambs, he's talking about the young people, the children. I think children are so important in our church. But he's also talking about the new people in faith. Care, care for them. Make sure that they grow up into the full stature and maturity of Jesus Christ. And when he says, feed my sheep, he's talking about the adults who are more mature in the faith as well. 
So possession and ownership of the believers are established and made very clear from by Jesus who the people belong to, and not, it was not to Peter. In this passage, Jesus restores Peter's pastoral authority. He invites Peter into what Richard Rohr in his book, Hidden Things, says is a very different sense of who Peter is. Peter does not belong to himself anymore. He belongs to Christ. And from that point on, Peter's life would no longer be about himself, and he could not and would not just go on living his life. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> From that point on, he was committing to whatever Christ might ask of him without even knowing what it might be. Imagine that. Peter was prepared to make any sacrifice if it would bring others to the truth of the grace of Christ, even if the divine calling put his life at risk, and even if it led him to lay down his life for Christ's flock like Christ did. Christ calls Peter into a more profound love for him so that Peter could lead others into a deeper love for God in Christ. Because let's face it, friends, we can't lead people to places we haven't gone ourselves. In Christ, our lives never point to ourselves. But always, says Richard Rohr, always beyond ourselves to the one who chose us uses us and loves us so that Peter would be Christ's usable instrument now to do God's thing. The authority to care for Christ's church emanates from Peter's professed love for Christ. That's where authority to care for Christ's church comes from, from our love for Christ. Because we know that Christ loves the people, and because we love Christ, we do not want to harm the things that Christ loves. We will care for them because we know they are his. His love for, and it's like Peter says, do you love me? And even if Peter could not, he could not generate love within himself to love God. So Jesus says, do you love me? And then he says, wait a second, Peter. God is going to give you a gift so you can do so. So our love for Christ is a gift of God. It's not something that we generate on our, on our own. It is a gift that God gives us to love God back. He gives us all we need to be the people that God is calling us to be. His love for Christ is a gift that authorizes him to care for Christ's lamb and sheep. In his commentary in the Gospel of John, Thomas Aquinas said, Feeding the sheep is confirming the believers in Christ so that they do not stray from the faith, so that they are helped with their needs, protected from harm, and brought back to the fold when they stray. Jesus had already proved his love for Peter, and Peter had already acknowledged him to be God, and Jesus had already proved himself to be good to Peter, and as a result, Peter was ready to say, yes, Lord, I love you. I trust you. You've been good to me. No matter what Jesus asked of him, he was then prepared to search for, rescue, and bring back God's scattered and stray sheep. He was ready to feed them with good pasture, bind up their injuries, and strengthen the weak. Friends, I am confident and clear about one thing. You belong to Christ. You belong to Christ. You love Christ and you live for Christ. Like you, I also have a, permit, uh, a passion and a commitment to Christ. Christ forever transformed my life and continues to do so as the years go by, as I seek to follow him. The love of Jesus, like you, fills me and directs all areas of my life. There's not one single area of my life that is untouched by the love of Christ operating in me. I've walked with Christ since I've been 17. And because I love Christ, I vow to do my best to love you who belong to Christ. Just the same way that Christ has loved me. We're going to spend a lot of time together over the next few years, God willing. And I'm excited about the church's future and our mission because of our amazing clergy and laity. Our message of God's grace and our concern and commitment for personal holiness, evangelism, service in the world, and social justice. But I'm also excited about the possibilities for mission and ministry because of our demographic context. In oneness with Christ and with each other and in our oneness and mission and ministry, we are going to make a transformational difference in people's lives and in the world. 
As you've heard me say on several occasions, our combined annual conferences have within it the fastest growing metro area in the U.S. and expansion is still ongoing. The Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex alone is already home to 7.8 million people but could also could increase to 11.2 million by 2045. This area alone is now the home for 25 of the 500 Fortune companies, trailing only New York and Chicago, according to the Kinder Institute for Urban Research at Rice University. As of 2020, the United States Census marks that the racial makeup of this area was 50.2% white, 27.5% Hispanic or Latino, 15.4% African American, 0.6% Native American, 0.1% Pacific Islander, 10% other races, and 2.4% from two or more races. Talk about racially, ethically, and culturally diverse cosmopolitan context for ministry friends. It doesn't get any better than this. It really doesn't. At the same time, there are challenges. For example, we have many left behind families and children and communities. And by the grace of God, we will engage them so that they know that God sees them, God hears their cries, God cares for them and draws near to them through ministries of church planting, spiritual formation, compassion, mercy, and justice. So the mission fields are ripe for the harvest. That should make our heads and our hearts so excited and to sing about where we are heading, where God is taking us to. I commit to doing this alongside you as your Episcopal leader. I expect to do great things. I expect to do great things as United Methodists within the boundaries of our annual conference and beyond. We will strive to be beatific disciples, deeply rooted in God and overflowing God's blessing. As beatific disciples, we will rely on God Offer God's hope and healing to people in our communities. We'll use our strengths to benefit others. We will be desperate to do the will of God and offer God's mercy and forgiveness to each other and the world. Our hearts full of God's love and justice will lead us to do the right things for the right reasons, even if it's not easy or popular. We will spread the peace of God we have experienced as children of God and practice our faith striving for perfection in God's love so we can offer Christ's redeeming love and accept people of all ages, nations, and races as Christ has accepted us. Second, we're going to engage in, min in meaningful min ministries and missions that will help heal, help, give hope, and make whole our fractured world. We will use and leverage our talents and passions for Christ for the sake of others, believing that everyone, everyone has something to offer. We will strengthen the bonds of our sacred connection with God, with each other, and with our neighbors. We will care for each other because we matter to God and we matter to each other. We will be an authentic Christian community that collaborates with our sister churches. No more isolated churches doing their own little thing. We are a network and a connection of churches and we're going to join together to do greater things than we could alone. We are, we're going to collaborate with our ecumenical partners because they are the body of Christ and they have a mission and we're going to work with them for the purposes of God's in, in, in our communities. We're going to work with community associates and seek the well-being of the communities where we're planted. For in the welfare of the communities where we are, our welfare also resides. Fourth, we're going to, listen to me very carefully, we're going to engage in sacred dialogue and discernment about issues affecting people's lives. That means that we're going to talk about the Brunos <laughs> hiding within our society's walls. And some of you didn't get it, right? Okay, I have grandchildren, and they, they saw a Disney movie, and they called it, it's called Encanto. And in that movie, there's a crazy uncle that nobody likes to talk about. I know you don't have any in your families. <laughs> but, but Bruno is a character who's perceived by the family as a black sheep, and he's painted as a villain. And they have all these horrible narratives about him, so Bruno hides in the walls of the house. He's blamed for the misfortunes of the family and of the community. He's different, and he's not present with the family. Instead, he hides and disappears within the walls of the home. And the moral of Disney's biggest song to date, we don't talk about Bruno, 
is that we must move past our preconceived notions and false judgments about others and get to know them as people. And so, yes, we're going to talk about the Brunos hiding in the walls of our society. This is more necessary today than ever as the world wrestles with racism, discrimination, mental health, intolerance, rampant violence, and widening ideological divides. We're going to break the vicious cycle of disparaging, vilifying, and dehumanizing people with different values and opinions. We can be better, and we will be better. In love and as Christ's children of peace, we're going to address our social dysfunction and mediate as ambassadors to resolve conflicts great and small. Fifth, I will do all I can to encourage to set you free, and to even go in front of you. Now stay focused on the church of 2050 and let you know that the goals ahead of us are doable, even though they will not be easy. We will celebrate progress, and when you or I or we fail, that's okay. We're going to applaud each other for taking a risk for Christ. We're going to get up, we're going to learn from our failures, and we're going to move on for Christ, because that's what Christ would have us to do. I will pray for you daily, and I ask that you pray for me. Together, let us pray for the faith, the grace, and the resolve to plant seeds that will one day grow, water seeds already planted, lay foundations that will need further development, and provide yeast that produces far beyond our capabilities. Jesus' question to Peter is relevant for us today because as disciples, Jesus gazes through our eyes and into our souls and hands over to us his most precious possession, his flock, his people, not just in our churches but in our communities. So I ask you, friends, do you love Christ? Do you love Christ? Feed Christ's lambs. Do you love Christ? Yes. Care for Christ's sheep. Do you love Christ? Yes. Feed Christ's sheep. Together, we're going to search for, rescue, and bring back God's scattered and stray sheep. We're going to feed Christ's flock with God's word so that faith can be born and nourished. Understanding can be deepened, and the possibility of transforming the world becomes more apparent. We will be a people that proclaim new life in Christ. We're going to heal the harm that is done. We're going to bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. Friends, the more time I serve as a bishop of the United Methodist Church and hold the sacred trust, the more this office both terrifies me and consoles me. I understand now the words of St. Augustine of Hippo, who in the fourth century offered this reflection upon being called to lead God's people as a new bishop of the Diocese of Hippo. He says, what I am for you terrifies me. What I am with you consoles me. For I am a bishop, but with you I am a Christian. The former is a duty, the latter is a grace. The former is a danger, the latter salvation. Some paintings of St. Augustine as well as some stained glass artwork feature him holding his heart, putting his hand to his heart, a symbol of his profound love for God and a symbol of his profound love for his fellow sisters and brothers. It also symbolized God's unfathomable love for us and Christ's command to love one another as we have been loved by him. So I ask you to hold your hand to your heart and say, Lord, I know you love me. Lord, you know I love you. Help me to love, care for, and feed your flock. This people of God 
United Methodists of the Central Texas and North Texas Conferences is our common sacred trust given to us by Christ, the great shepherd of our souls.